Welcome to the West Side Barbell Podcast. Today's guest is Dante Leon. Dante, pleasure to have you back. The last time around was about, what, seven months ago? Yeah, something like that, beginning of the year. Um, how's prep going for ADCC? Things have been really good uh, between training and uh, fitting in some competitions before the big show just to stay active, get my experience up in the rule set. So things have been clicking really well. Uh, training's been meshing well between strength training and jujitsu. Uh, wrestling training that gets implemented for ADCC. So things are kind of fitting together nice. How do you choose your uh, comps leading up to the event? Try and keep them with some distance away from um, the bigger competition. You know, that's the main goal. So these ones have to be some distance away so I can have a continuous training camp so I'm not away. Or, you know, with competition, there's a lot of unknowns. So if something were to happen, uh, I want to have some distance between then and uh, the the event. So try not to compete like two or three or four weeks before. Try and keep it a little bit away from that. And uh, try and pick tournaments where I can get the quality of work that I need at the time. You know, if I need a deep tournament, I can go hunt down a little bit deeper tournament and see a deeper talent pool. If I need something that's just quick, I can kind of get that with a lot of these ADCC opens or yeah. IBJJF opens. When you go into these um, kind of warm-up matches, do you have targets or like... Uh goals when you go in that you're trying to go okay this is where i'm at this is what i need to improve on yeah for sure i think uh it's a lot of data you're getting a lot of data data however you want to say it from those things it's just kind of like it's uh if you use it correctly it can accelerate your training um because you're going to get answers to things that you couldn't have gotten outside of competition um a competition there's really no there's a lot of ways to prepare for it, but there's no way to prepare for the kind of intricacies of competition, the nerves, the anxiety, the unknowns. I mean, there was like a brawl at the last event that just like ended matches for like 20, 30 minutes, you know, like things like that can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a long point period of time, like being at the venue, waiting for things to start. It's not like as regimented as the bigger tournaments and the super fight events that I've done. So there's things you always have to adapt to and you're never going to be able to do that unless you compete. So uh, taking all that into consideration, you go in with... A goal but you know at the end of the day it is competition so you're trying to win it, whatever way that you're trying to win whatever techniques you're trying to use is all dependent on um your big picture the big picture of adcc and all dependent on what my training's like at the moment can you give us an example of just say one goal or feedback you got from a maybe a previous a previous warm-up match leading into an event and how you adjusted for it yeah so a couple of times it's happened where i know that in a certain match in a certain tournament rule set i'm going to need to rely on techniques from different areas that would differ from other events so like an adcc the standing position is you know heavily favored you have to stay standing at some point in the match you have to be comfortable on your feet to defend and execute takedowns so if I can find a tournament where I know somebody's kind of tough on top, has a really good base, I have to be able to put them down to beat them or I make that as a challenge, make that as a goal, uh, then I get a lot out of that. And then I can take that back and see, am I where I think I should be? Do I need to improve on anything? Do, it, you know, do I have it right? And very rarely do you have it right. You know, mm -hmm. Very rarely do you have it right. Very rarely does it go the way that you really think it'll go. So... It's important to go in there with not a lot of expectation, but really focus on, you know, entering the tournament with a set goal and really reflecting after. How do you transfer what we do here in the gym into your discipline? So with, on the outside, I think it's the, you know, the conditioning obviously gets increased here, the strength, the you lack the acid threshold, all these kinds of things. But I think the, how dynamic the training is, how it changes, uh, there's never really a time where we can be prepared for what's coming. Even when we look at a program and we see box squats, we don't know box height. We don't know bars sometimes. We, there's a lot of like uh, different things that change about the workout that doesn't ever give me like solid footing on what I know is going to happen. Very rarely, maybe at the end of a wave, I kind of have an idea of what it's going to be. But I know that, you know, we just ended a wave today, right? I mm -hmm. think 
yep. next week's going to be like, I have no idea. I really don't know what's going to, what's going to come out of that. So you have to be ready. You have to be adaptable. And I think that helps me a lot with training and helps me a lot with competition. And then the regimented side of things, how if you really break it down, uh, the more I've read, the more I've studied and the more I've had experiences here, I can see how it's scheduled and how it's waved out and everything of the training. And I can take that and implement that into my jujitsu training, which is something that I think the sport hasn't had for a long time was uh, proper training structure. Is there any exercises <laughs> specific to your sport that you take as a kind of like a converter, something that like, okay, we did all the strength training. I can use this sport specific training to translate all this into uh, SPP, sport specific. Yeah. So uh, if we're looking at exercises, I think outside of like the main ones that we always use, which, you know, squat, bench, and dead and, and variations of that, there's a lot of different things. Sled drags have been w what I hate the most by far, but it has been <laughs> uh, a huge game changer. Um, jumps, you know, if left to my own devices, would never jump the amount that we do. And, or, or look at somebody saying jumping, you know, four times 10 twice a week would yeah. be like, that guy's nuts. But the way we break it down, the way we do it, it makes a lot of sense. That's, that's been a huge help. Um, the other uh, work we do outside of just strength training, uh, we did a session or a few sessions for four or five weeks time where we directly worked on the hamstrings, directly work on uh, balancing out strength between each leg, uh, different things like that just kind of make things a lot better, a lot easier, and uh, make you a lot stronger in ways that, that the basic exercise kind of after a while didn't, you know? So I think that's a big one. Uh, hypers was something I always did. I think they're very important. Uh, one of the biggest ones, honestly, was the back attack. And there was yeah. a love-hate relationship with the back attack. But, I mean, I, there was a love-hate relationship with it, but I actually went out and got one of my, my own from my own gym, too, you know, to have it. So... Uh, yeah, I think that is a great piece of equipment. And you know, the more if I look around here, I can see um, pieces of equipment that helped. One of the the biggest ones that I've seen was switching over to six by six with bench, especially with the football bar, yeah. having the grips that way. Um, you know, I felt like changing it, waving it out that way, like really helped bench strength, really helped, really helped everything. It's, I wouldn't say it's tricky, but you guys compete all year round makes it challenging in a good way from a programming perspective because we may have to change it on a weekly basis. We know the waves are going there, but bringing in the uh, six by sixes and the five by fives and the squat um, just helps put that variety back in there. You can mm -hmm. see where you're really good when, when everyone first started, the first three reps were explosive as crap yeah. and then four and five were like, what is this? Yeah, and six. For sure. But how fast you guys picked up in it? Um, first week it was tough. Second week you're like, okay. Third week it was it was nothing. Easy, yeah. Um, a question that uh, I wanted to ask is that gym strength does not a lot of the time carry over to mat strength. So how do you make that work? Did you have a high level of mat strength before gym strength, or do you think people who are strong in the gym just have no idea how to utilize that when it comes to jujitsu. I, I think that's what it is. You know, I think if you take a guy who deadlifts 800 pounds and he has this crazy kind of strength, you know, that upper 3% strength, uh, he doesn't really know how to train jujitsu. So he's not going to be able to kind of like channel focus that strength where he needs to. Um, I'm very technical. I know how to do jujitsu. I know how to do things very well on a technical side. So when I can put my strength behind that, it feels different. You know, uh, if you were to take my technique and give it to somebody who's twice as strong with as as I am, they would feel twice as strong as me. I, I don't think it's just because I'm mat specifically strong. I yeah. think it's because I'm technical and and good at my sport, so my strength can really complement it well. Um, a lot of people, when you're when they say like, "Dude, he was so fast. He was like, he was so explosive." that's a very small part of the game. That means he can kind of like get away from mm -hmm. you or get past you quickly, things like that. Uh, some of those, some people like that lack isometric strength. Some of them lack um, 
you know, muscle endurance, things like that. So with the training, being able to cover all bases and strengthen you on all levels, uh, I think the focus in jujitsu should be like your technique yeah. more so, you know, it's, it's always kind of crazy when you see like really strong kind of meathead guys try out jujitsu and they do things completely wrong and they kind of like throw people around still. Like that's kind of crazy if, if Mac I were to try that. Mac Arnold's, uh, Matt, not Mac Arnold's, Mac McFarlane, confusing him with an old buddy of mine, sorry. Um, he, uh, he's got that kind of strength apparently, but, uh, <laughs> you know, most people, some of the, uh, if I were to try something that some, some people that come in off the street who bench, you know, 365 and they're, these pretty strong guys, you know, I see them do things. I'm like, man, I would like tear my shoulder off if I tried something like that. You know, I tried to like lift somebody up with one arm and an arm bar, but if I can do some technical type of escape and put pressure technically and I can use my strength behind it. It's going to feel a lot different. Uh, I was talking to a buddy of ours, uh, Tony, who's been a in jiu-jitsu for a long time and he brought up a good point about bracing is that the more experienced you get, you seem to flow and not be as rigid and giving out everything. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, when you increase your strength level then you have the ability to obviously uh emit more strength but that can be counterproductive from endurance standpoint how do you know how to pace yourself um i think it, that's a thing that's big on feel i think i think that comes from probably your buddy tony i'm gonna rip off what he said but experience you know mm -hmm. if you experience matches and longer matches and, and tougher matches in competition, you have a better feel, a better uh, kind of like spidey sense on how to, how to deal with it, you know. But I think, uh, I think you can kind of carry it over from training as well. You know, when we're here, we're exerting ourselves for those, you know, even when we condense these workouts and we're trying to get them under an hour, we're trying to get them under 75 minutes. You know, it's a long time to be in the gym, yeah. kind of like going between exercise to exercise. But... Um, there is a way that you're giving a hundred percent, but you're not literally redlining every single thing, you know, and that's what somebody who's new is probably going to redline. They're going to hold their breath and they're going to grit their teeth on every single thing they do. And they have about like three or four good pushes before they're gassed. You know what I mean? And there is a technical, there's a technical side to lifting as well. There's a technical side to training, executing, um, exercises properly. Uh, you know, if you're doing rows properly, you're fatiguing your back. And if you're doing them improperly, you're just like throwing weight around or wasting your time or you're fatiguing some other muscle that's going to end up when you do shoulder presses, you're going to kind of be fucked. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there is a technical side to training as well that can help you get through it. For beginners at your school, how do you set them up from one, a jiu-jitsu aspect and then the secondly from a training aspect? Uh, somebody who's a beginner, if I were, the only people who are going to be like lifting at my gym are competitors. Like those are the, really be the only people that mm. I would focus on like this kind of training for. Um, like no offense, but like if, if they're just kind of recreational, I'm not going to try and put them through kind of like what I go through. You know, the big thing is about them enjoying jujitsu, but the biggest thing is, is creating an environment where you have pressure on yourself to evolve. You want to learn. You want to be, you know, hungry for knowledge, especially in the beginning. But you really want to take away that kind of ego and kind of dick measuring side of like male sports, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, you don't want people to come in and think they have to compete or have to win rounds or have to impress you with what they do or how many rounds they do or anything like that. You want people who come in and learn uh, drill techniques, learn how to, uh, perform moves properly and, uh, train properly as well. I mean, when, uh, when weight's too heavy in the gym, we can say it's too heavy and you can take some weight off and you know us enough to say that we're lying to you as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? As a coach. So I think with people in jujitsu, it becomes a lot like that. It's being honest. You know, if you're caught in a submission, you can tap and you can kind of move on and learn what you did wrong and get better. And, uh, you know, the goal is at the, at the end, it's not in two weeks, three weeks time where a lot of people come in, they don't see the success that they think they should see when 
why would they think that they should have all this success when they don't know they've never done it? You know what I mean? So that's where my job kind of comes in keeping people a little bit calm and being like, you know, enjoy it. If you enjoy it, you'll stay with it longer and you'll, you'll see those results as they come. What's it like having um, Max and Lawson around? Uh, I love having those guys around. You know, they're great. Very different as far as their roles and their place on the team. Max is somebody who I've known since you know, 2018 and 2019. I've known him a long time. From a similar region in uh, Canada as, as I am. And, uh, you know, kind of just been, uh, he's been here maturing, growing up getting better, improving, uh, turning into a, to a, to a man really, you know, when he came here, he was a young, young 21, 22 year old, now 25 years old. So he's a, he's a great competitor, high level black belt ranked in the world. Uh, he's a great instructor. He's a great, um, member of the team. He's kind of like, a assistant, uh, a lot, him and, uh, another guy, Brad Schneider, kind of like the, uh, OGs of the team, I mm-hmm. would say. So they're kind of like, you know, assistant captains there. And Lawson, somebody who's just coming up. Lawson has only been with me, I, I want to say less than a year, maybe more than nine months, you know, somewhere in that region. If I, I forgot his anniversary, he's going to get mad at me like he's my girlfriend or something. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, he's been with me less than a year. I know that. But uh, he's, uh, he's a kid who has immense potential. You know, he can he can easily get to a level where he can thrive from being a jujitsu competitor and, you know, hopefully one day a school owner. But at the moment right now, um, you know, he just works, he busts his ass. He's trying to put as much time in on the mat as he can to, uh, kind of accelerate his career. But, um, he has a much higher level of athleticism than pretty much anybody I've ever had on the team for sure. You know, he's a, he's a legit good athlete. Mm -hmm. He's, um, he's strong. He's really adapts well to training. He learns quickly. So he's kind of gifted in that sense, a lot more than anybody I've, I've had on the team or, or close to me in training coming up from that kind of beginner level. For your team, what are some of the most critical aspects you look for in the people you have around you? Uh, I, I like it's, it'll sound basic, but I want them to work hard and I want them to not make excuses and kind of, you know, and I, I want to see a little bit of what they have to give or what they can kind of take early on, you know, as early on as I can. I mean, I, I don't want them to walk through the door and then it turns into, you know, like Navy SEALs Hell Week training or anything, but I want it to be hard for them. I want them to be uncomfortable and I want to see what happens if they fade, you know, if that breaks them a little bit or they end up quitting. I'd rather they just quit earlier than than later uh, because if they don't quit in the beginning, they usually stick around for a long time or permanently in, in a lot of the cases with people I have and they get much, much better. They improve drastically. There's really nobody that's been around me or on the team that hasn't improved as far as jujitsu goes. You know what I mean? It's, they've, they've gotten far better on all fronts with jujitsu. And, uh, now members of the team are starting to follow me up here to, uh, West side and getting their own training in programming their own training. So they're kind of, uh, evolving kind of their spot. It's not just jujitsu anymore. They're kind of, um, molding, getting into the different, uh, facets of what it takes to be a professional athlete. How much responsibility do you feel you have to pass on that knowledge since you're part of this, I mean, the first generation of truly professional grapplers? Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm trying not to put a lot of pressure on myself about it, but I definitely want them to have success. You know what I mean? I definitely want them to be successful. And um, anybody else who comes along in the meantime who, who ends up, you know, panning out if, if we have like a good connection or, um, they think they can train here and they make it through everything. I, I would like them to have success too. You know, any people in the future, um, the people I have around, I consider them good people and, and, uh, I like seeing them succeed. So, you know, my job is really, I, I have to take care of my own things right now, but I'm setting myself up to that when I can. And when I'm done, 
you know, my own side of things that I have not only like good people around me, good established um, competitors or former competitors that are now coaches and we're kind of in the same shoes that we can 100% focus on everything that's coming in, everything that's going on around the gym and hopefully even expand the team, you know? So right now it's, the team is smaller and more condensed as far as the competitors go, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, different hats that everybody kind of has to wear. You know, everybody's, everybody on the team's competing or, you know, working involved in the gym, whether they're instructing, teaching classes, or um, working in other areas of the gym or the business. So everybody's kind of involved in a lot of things. The day that, you know, it's all done for me as far as competition, I can focus 100%. You know, Max will probably be just about done himself if everything goes well. Lawson will be coming up to the height of his career, hopefully, you know. So looking at things like that, it leaves me in a good position to think if I take this time to build up what I can, um, once I'm able to focus 100%, I'll be able to give to a lot more people. How difficult is it for you to see significant improvements in your skill set year after year? Especially the way um, where you have your team and with everything that you're doing. Let me rephrase a different way. In strength training, we look for five pound PRs, right? Mm -hmm. We want to keep chipping away at that. But you get to a level of strength where those five pound PRs take a lot of work. Um, for your skill set, the level you're at, how long does it take to add another uh, weapon to your armory of skills? Really don't know. I, you know, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, and when I say I feel like, I, I know I do because I can evaluate my training, evaluate my competition results, evaluate how I feel all the different things with, with lifting, it's a lot easier because you just look at yeah. like, did you lift, you know, two and a half pounds more? Well, that's still a PR. Or did you lift, did you get the five pound? And sometimes when I've gone to revisit exercises, I've hit 10 and 15 pounds higher than what yeah. I hit in, in a previous training block. So, um, and you never, with, with the lifting, you can see exactly what, what happens. But that was the thing about jujitsu and fighting for so long, I think was, you know, you didn't have a good training structure. So you didn't really have a way to see what was working or what got you better or what worked for you. Yeah. Um, now I feel like I have my training figured out a lot better and I have for a while. So I'm able to kind of uh, log and see these different things, go back and video review, see different things that I've done in competition and see the improvement, you know, and it can happen in like a week's time or mm -hmm. it could feel like it takes like a month, but you know, it does happen. I do improve and there's really no like blueprint, I would say, for how long I think I, I start to notice something. Is it a matter of refinement than it is in like rather than going out and trying to learn new moves? I think, I think you can learn new techniques for sure, but it's like how new is it? Like it's never going to be really that new to me, yeah. you know, because I'm still so current as far as like, you know, the most current people and the people who do the edgiest things are active fighters. Like if a boxer sees something and he brings it to the gym and he starts using it, it's something that a current champ was using on, a, on a, like a pay-per-view fight. So it's like kind of the same thing for me. And I'm like at these events that other people do really cool shit that yeah. everybody wants to emulate. You know, I watch that guy compete or like I compete against some of these people that do cool things in matches that people want to emulate. So I'm kind of on the cutting edge of that. So it's, it's easy to stay current for me because, you know, I'm there, I'm so invested. I know so much jujitsu with training for 17 years. It counts for a lot and a lot of experience that it's easy to adapt and kind of see how those things could fit into my game. Is it similar to, it's a variation. Just say if we're trying to yeah. uh, get your triceps stronger, it's like, okay, well, we're going to do a strict tricep extension compared to a JM. At the end of the day, we're still trying to train mm -hmm. the tricep. It's just the feel aspect Correct. of it. Yeah. I think it's part of that. I think even, um, you know, we box squatted recently to like an extremely low box, especially compared to like what we typically did. Typically, we were 
at and just below parallel. Then we did a low box, which was well below parallel. And now we're doing an extremely low box. And, you know, first week was okay. We did, you know, decently heavy, not super heavy to kind of get the groove. Second week, like last week was super hard on the exercise. Today, not easy, but extremely manageable, you know, doable. Yeah. Every rep was good. Full lock on every rep. I didn't like rock back and feel like I was going to fall over or anything. And it's the same bar, the same weight. It's the same, you know, rep scheme, everything. So yeah, something like that just takes a little bit of adaptation, takes a little bit of, you know, refinement, things like this. A lot of the positions and, and things that I see people do, it's just a matter of being able to make it feel right, make it work for me, you know, with lifting, uh, a variation like that we'll do once a week with jujitsu. I have the ability, I can do it every day if I want to. So I can speed yeah. up the process. If I see something that really intrigues me or I think would work really well, I can spend 20 minutes on it a day, every day for two weeks. And I can really accelerate my, you know, level of that, uh, of that move. Now that you're firmly established in the way we train and since the last time we talked which i think was november ish i think it was back because we're still in the old building um what are some of the stuff that stands out now compared to when you first began here right so first when i first started the biggest wake up kind of call was the conditioning side of things was the density of the training was the things like that and since then even before then, I had time to adapt to it, and now I have even more time to adapt to it. Um, the biggest thing now was seeing how, like, how many workouts I've seen, how many workouts I have done is the variance. You know, the variance is, is huge. There's a crazy amount of variance in the workouts, and it's subtle. In, in reality, it is subtle. If you're doing a weighted carry, uh, and we do the wheelbarrow or then we do like farmer's carry or then we do safety squat bar. It's a, it's a subtle change, but it's a change. There's a lot of variance and you can't take last week into it and think it's going to work out the yeah. same way. Uh, so there's a lot of variance here. There's really nothing, nothing you can do besides, you know, coming in and pulling your socks up and getting to work that you can really do to prepare for it. Like there's no, there's no like cheat sheet or anything or like, you know, multiple choice. You can kind of always know it's C or I, I, I really, I can't even bank on what you're going to throw at me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, I'd it, lose a bet every time if I tried to bet what we were going to do next Tuesday when, it, when a new wave starts, you know, so. I, I think with your personality and the way you approach training and like you're very proficient and methodical by not providing that adds another layer of, I, I guess, um, training into the effect of making subtle changes, making these things, not programming um, weeks in advance so you can time prep and know, um, quickly realizing like where you're really, really good at. I'm like, okay, how can we make that? But like bands, for instance, like you're one of the best I've seen to actually use the band correctly up and down, stick mm-hmm. in that groove. You give you chains, you're like, okay, now you can, you have to think more to get through yeah. stuff. And like, that's the great part about coaching. It's like, okay, let's change these things up. What's been pretty, I'm pretty pumped about is seeing the improvements with your teammates coming through, especially Max and Lawson. Seeing Max go from what is this place to slowly but surely getting into it. And now, I mean, the last few weeks, the buy-in is like to where he's leading a group. Yeah. Someone who's at, who's just going through the motions is now like, okay, I would like, goddamn, he, yeah. I lost a hundred bucks to that guy today for a bet. And seeing Lawson come from a uh, high three, low four squat to get a 535 yeah. squat, like the, in a short chain or short amount of time. Pretty crazy. Um, it's, it's crazy, but it's where it's, it allows us to see like, okay, what we're doing is right because it's going across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, but truly seeing when buy-in happens. Yeah. And you sure. can see that. And that comes a level of maturity, I think, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Very important, man. I mean, I used to have to twist Max's arm to get him in the gym, you know, when he first started. He was always a hard worker, but, you know, the lifting was something he didn't enjoy. I remember 
asking people, I said, when I'm away, tell me how many times Max lifts. And they would tell me that many, you know what I mean? So, yeah. and now he's exactly what you said. He comes in, he's fired up. He's ready to work. He looks at the time that we got. He tries to beat it every time. He usually does beat it every time. So, you know, he's busting his ass and he's working really hard. His strength has increased. Um, you know, his strength increase might kind of uh, be overshadowed by like how fast and excessive Lawson's has been. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Lawson is a kid who worked out before, who came in loving to work out, was like hard-nosed kid in the gym. So, you know, he got those beginner gains right away and he shot up. Like now he has legit strength, you know what I mean? He's He's always been strong and... On the mat, you feel the difference, but in the gym, it's like, it's, it's, un, you know, it's, it's crazy. Over a hundred pounds and a short amount of time here is absurd. And still been able to compete. Yeah. Like we're not making power, power lifters. lifters. We are making athletes who yeah. are like, we want you the strongest as necessary for your weight class, but um, still been able to get up and get it out of here. And that's what I wanted to ask. When you get done here today, right? Where, like, what's your Tuesday like? Yeah, so when I get done here, uh, it's typically between 8 and 8.30. So um, get out of here. That's usually I have a coffee or something. Uh, head out, relax for a little bit. Then I go train at Immortals at Matt Brown's gym. Uh, we do a session there that's typically shorter, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, then from there, out, get uh, something to drink, something to eat, small, because they have a training session at Ronin Training Center at 1 p.m. So, and then that one will be a little longer, maybe hour 15, hour and a half. Um, so, you know, if you notice that kind of the training sessions are kind of condensed, kind of like uh, West Side, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we get in, we get the work, and then we get out. We try not to waste too much time or use too much time just sparring. But yeah, I have a pretty busy Tuesday. And then typically... You know, today we're filming a podcast, but typically it'd be ice bath and uh, a sauna over here in the early, early, like late afternoon, early evening, um, every every Tuesday now for the last eight eight weeks. Did it take you a while to build up that tolerance to handle such a load? Yeah, a hundred percent. Honestly, um, it was all I've I've known this about myself, and it was kind of something. It was something I used to say to to you and, and to Mac when I first started, when we were um, over at the old building. I used to say all the time, like, give me a week or I need like two weeks. Yeah. And then I remember one time the workout was really hard. And I was like, dude, I'm, I'm fucked up. And you're like, do we need to adjust anything? I said, I'll let you know in a week. Because I know I need some time to kind of yeah. get it. You know what I mean? And I know I'll always be able to do it because I know I have, I know I have the mindset to just like get up and go no matter what. As long as nothing's really, you know, messed up, but, you know, I'll get up and go no matter what, how sore, how hard it is. And, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks of doing it, I was able to adapt, you know, and I think that's the reason it's so unique is it's, it's so hard to adapt, but there's always that you got to adapt like within two weeks kind mm -hmm. of thing. Like you can't not perform an exercise well for th this whole three week yeah. wave. That's, that doesn't happen. Like you're kind of forced to maybe have like one workout where it's like it was shaky, but it better be right the next week, you know? We're constantly chasing, uh, chasing adaptation, but limiting and avoiding accommodation. Yeah. Um, and two, I, I, if we're doing our job right, we're completely recalibrating what you believe is possible with you. I don't think a lot of, I think a lot of athletes underestimate how much they can get out of themselves, especially if you're truly an athlete. Yeah. The more athletic you are, you're going to see huge differences in three weeks. And then to completely readjust, like, oh man, I thought, I thought I was in shape. I thought it was strong. Like we had those uh, new kids who started two weeks ago and they're like, oh, we've, we train hard. And I'm like, oh, okay, that doesn't mean that like, you train hard. Like, yeah. you, like you, anything can be hard. I can yeah. jump up and down real hard. Um, and then halfway through the workout, they realize, oh, we're, we're in the deep end here. Yeah. Uh, because there's no, the way the system has to run is we can slow down. So if you join the crew, you, like we will taper it percent wise and we'll give you a kind of a train to train period. But there is, we don't have time because yeah. you guys are at a level now. If someone jumps into your group, which you brought down a couple of guys today and they were tapered down, but if they try to go at the pace you guys go, they're just not going to do it. But yeah. you have to be able to 
adapt and last into it. For sure. I, uh, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny thing. You know, you can make anything hard, but there's not really one specific area of the wor- workout, specifically the Tuesday workout, that's easy. Like, example, if you're just really strong and you're explosive, you can rip through the deadlifts and rip through the squat and the bench and all that. There's these like high rep set fucking dumbbell exercises and step ups and sled work and sled pushes and carries and all these different things that there's no way that you're just like the man at all of them. You know what I mean? Like there is some area in that workout that you're going to hit and you're kind of going to be like bogged down in the mud a little bit. So like for me, it's, it's not really ever a challenge to get through the five by five and now the six by six on bench. Like I can get through that quickly. I've always been able to get through the dynamic uh, lifts quickly and efficiently with proper execution. But then we get to these high rep, you know, shoulder exercise. I'd be like, dude, I'm dying. What were you talking about? 25s, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And then you start to like, think about the workout. You're like, man, what do I have to do? Like, I got to make it to that. I have to yeah. survive that. And then it, it all changes again. You've got to find like the new thing that you got to prepare for. You know, there is some fucked up thing in every workout that you got to like figure out yourself a little bit because mm-hmm. it just doesn't mesh with you you know yeah. what i mean and it's like even if you can do it you do it and it hurts you more than it hurts miles and joe or justin or the other guys in my group like i can see like there's something that i do that i'm like i'm dying right now these guys are like killing me on this yeah. and then it switches and it switches and it switches and it switches so that's kind of a that's kind of a really cool thing but really really challenging thing you know mentally physically I think the only way we are able to get away with that is that, and it came from Louis, is that we do the workouts before you guys do them. And that's the only way we know it's going to catch. Or it's like, this is going to make that difficult because that's going to get that fatigued. And then getting through, like right now we're going through a, We'll start with the squat variation with accessories, deadlift variation accessories, and bench um, with a variation with accessories. And then you think, okay, this is, this is just a good workout. And it is a good workout by itself. But what would happen if we had jumps? And then what happens if we had jumps with banded leg curls? And what happens if we had jumps with banded leg curls and we did uh, barbell abs? And I think where a lot of coaches fall apart is they'll dream the stuff up, but they won't actually go do it. Yeah. And then that's where you're like, okay, we have to, because when we first started, we're like, oh, there's no way we're going to hit the time crunch. There's just no way we have to scale this back down. And I think that's where people either lose athletes, get people hurt, or they realize like, oh, this is just, like none of this is done on an ego trip because it just strips you of ego. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what I, I wish. And I, like, there's a few coaches who do it that you have to do the workouts your athletes are doing. Yeah. And then there's two, we can give you the times. So then how do you know if you're doing well? You should be able to crush us. And then it just sets the tone and the pace. What we learned is we can't work out with you. Like we'll jump in if someone's not here. But when you work out with the athletes, then it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be objective, right? Yeah. When I get in, like I want you to suffer and vice versa, then the whole aspect of the coaching goes out the window real fucking. Yeah, exactly. Real fast. Yeah, we turn into enemies like, quick Quick, frenemies but yeah yeah for sure i think uh another thing too like what you touched on a little bit was when you don't do the workout you don't know you know how it's effectiveness how hard it's going to be if it's hard enough you know all those things like if you're not doing the workouts you kind of fall back into the thing where you're like do a kettlebell swing ladder up to 25 and then back down and somebody does it they're like what are you fucking nuts it took me like 40 minutes to do bro like you just sat there and just thought of something that'd be really difficult or like how to increase the volume of this, you know, crazy workout by doing yeah. like something crazy. But you like, you never did it. You never did 400 pound sled walks, bro. Why are you telling me to do this? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So everything is, there's things that look like they can't be done, but they can be because you did them. You know, there's been times that I've looked you know, I look, I look on Sunday night and see, and I see what's posted. And then I look on Monday in the middle of the afternoon and I see shit's changed. And sometimes it's like, cool. And other times it's like, okay. So he realized that workout was too easy. I was crossing my fingers that he wasn't going to change <laughs> anything, but he realized it was too easy and he, he made slight adjustments, you know? So I see that happen all the time. But it's, it's a, 
it's a relationship, right? To where I want you and everyone else there to hold us as accountable as we hold you. And I never want to be in a position to where, will you go and fucking do it? Well, it, well we have. Yeah. Like th that's to where, and I think as an athlete, I know from my perspective, if I was doing a workout, knowing that the person who is there coaching me has done it, removes that there's no way there's no way this can be yeah and once you because you go through that internal monologue about halfway through especially when you're at that one exercise where you're sucking and everyone else is crushing you and you're like okay well they've well i think that just helps to to get through and it, everything's about buy-in too for the culture without the yeah. the gym culture we have we've got nothing I mean, we've got it to a really really good point absolutely absolutely if you don't have uh it's all it's when I say to the guys, you know, it's about team, the guys back yeah. home, you know, it's about team. It's about you guys being real teammates. And that's the thing that a lot of people, a lot of teams miss. A lot of teams miss that stuff. A lot of groups of people who train together, you know, they might not think they're teams, but they have to think of themselves as a team, I think. And I think that culture is here too. Everybody thinks of it, we think of it as a team, you know what I mean? Everybody wants to see everybody succeed. And even though it's unique, because we're all in a little bit of different things, it's easy yeah. for me to want to support Lance and Miles and what they do, their respective sport, just like they want to support me in it too. And uh, the best thing we can do is come in here and push each other, you know? And having like the, the power of a leaderboard and the power of like the times. The, the, the times is really good because we've got multiple different groups coming in. And the first question is like, what was the, the time done by each group? And... With the uh, the accessories of the other days, like we're able, unless you're in, injured or there's something abnormally wrong with you, we don't have to get to the level of individualization that I think people really believe you need. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the the group and the culture creates the consistency, and that's yeah. by far the the biggest aspect of what we do, along with the rotation of everything every three weeks. Um, What are, if you're going to pick out five things for someone who is starting to take jujitsu seriously and wanting to become a pro athlete, what mm -hmm. are five things they should put in their checklist? Uh, so one would be eliminating all distractions. And you can do this on a pretty kind of like surface level. I'm not talking like you need to get super in-depth and be like, you know, Auntie Anne doesn't support jujitsu, so never talking to her again kind of thing. Like, you don't need to be crazy with it, but like, you know, you don't need to really change a whole lot of things, but you need to kind of, you know, you have to delete kind of those bad social kind of things that, that young adults kind of lean into, you know, hanging out, drinking, spending money, things like that. All those things are going to need to be reeled in really, really quickly because you're going to need your health. You're going to need your sleep. You're going to need your, your body to be functioning and you're going to need money. You know, if you want to be good at anything, you need money. You have to pay to go compete. You have to pay to train. You have to pay to, if you're training more, you got to buy more gear. If you're training more, you're going to get sick more. You're going to eat more, all those things, all that has to increase. So I think that's one. I think you should start looking at and trying to emulate and study people who are already successful, not just learn from them. I think you need to study them. You need to study how they live, what things they do. I know in today's day and age, you, you don't know everybody like for real, but we have social media that people spend their entire fucking day on. And some people spend their entire day on making content and things like that, you can get a pretty good idea of what people do or, you know, what they're pitching to you that they mm -hmm. do. So those are things that are easy for you to emulate. You need to never not, you need, need to never stop being a student. You know, you're not a, if you think that you want to be a professional athlete, you're like, I, you, your uh, labels change, but you haven't really changed that much. You know, especially if mm -hmm. you're just starting out, like, you made a decision three weeks ago, bro. You're not that much different. You can still show up to the same class and, you know, study instructionals or film or anything like that and, and improve. I'm probably not going to get to five because I only have one more. Uh, my biggest one, I think, is developing healthy habits. I think developing a healthy habit of 
nutrition, of sleep. And again, this doesn't need to be anything super deep. You don't need to go buy like those pads and have a CPAP machine and all these things. Maybe if you need it, I guess, but you know, you don't need to have a crazy diet, but you know, you need to start living with health because that's the biggest thing. This could run, you, it could run your dreams off, off the rails really quick. You get seriously sick or injured, you know? So that's the thing that you have to take care of the most. I think when you're starting out is get your health get your body kind of functioning right before you put it through some real shit, you know? When, um, when I talk about you as an athlete, like two things, and there's many things that come up, but there's two that's always at the top and that's, uh, uh, accountability and consistency. Like the, the level of consistency of your training in terms of achieving PRs, not being greedy, like is phenomenal. Like, I, I don't think there's been very rare where there's a week where there's not a PR posted. Um, and that level of accountability and feedback to where if something's messed up or something's not right, like you will give that back in. And I think from a coach's perspective, having athletes like that makes our job easier and better because we can tailor in stuff. And the other side of that is uh, knowing that you actually take care of yourself back to your health makes our job super simple. Yeah. Uh, to where there are sometimes athletes are walking time bombs. We got no idea what's happening. Um, thanks for now working with, uh, with the armory and having feedback from physical therapists makes it immensely better. But like, I'm with you on the health aspect, like to where if you're not sleeping at the very least, like that's screwing yourself up to where I have no idea how Joe comes in, does what he does based on, I mean, uh, Joe's a firefighter, so he's working insane shifts. He came in on three hours sleep today and was just a, <laughs> was just a new man. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it, that that's kind of the shitty part about wanting to be an athlete is like, that's what you're going to need to do. If, yep. you know, if, if that happens, if you have a night of no sleep, it's like too bad. You can't be like, you know, I need to get sleep today. And yeah. You're not going to go train. Like, you have to go train. You have to go train, but you have to have a good base. You know what I mean? If you have a bad night of sleep, it shouldn't run you off the rails. It's only going to run you off the rails if you're unhealthy, yeah. in my opinion. And you don't need to be like super strict about it, but you know, six or eight hours, it's not, especially if you're a young person who's trying to become an athlete, that's really not asking for a whole lot. You know what I mean? But to your training to be your best and your worst day possible. Yeah. It's very easy to be your best and your best day possible. And then having the power of routine, because when chaos happens or stuff goes amiss, if you have no routine, you have no way to pull yourself back into reality. Correct. And um, th that's where the, like the power of like a, uh, a warm up is it's not just a warm in the body, but it's actually preparing your mind. And uh, I've seen athletes who have to do media obligations, or like you said, uh, something abroad could happen, or some event happens where there is time gone, and you have to realign yourself. If you have no method of realignment, like you are at a huge disadvantage to people who do. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think a lot of those things you can't experience plays a huge part you know yeah. like the the veterans of the game the veterans of the fight game you see how they deal with press conferences and things like that they deal with it very professionally even if they talk shit or even if they're a little bit you know showboaty or arrogant they deal with it very well they know how to deal with it a lot better than the younger athletes typically yeah. um so you know experience plays a big role but if you don't have that routine like you said you don't have really anything to ground yourself to when shit gets real you know and when when that happens, when things are chaos, when things are chaos or the unknowns become, you know, out in the open and, you know, everything changes, the dynamic of things change, uh, you're really going to be lost, you know, you're really going to be lost. And if the other person you're competing against isn't, then you're at a huge disadvantage at that point. How do you keep <clears throat> the level of confidence that you have in your skill set? Uh, especially, I guess I'll go back. How do you deal with a loss? And how do you keep the confidence to keep going forward from that? I think dealing with a loss is the same in a lot of ways to dealing with a win. For me, after I win a match, I'll ask my coach what he thinks. We'll talk about it. We'll reflect on it. We'll spend a day or two kind of watching film over and seeing what we could have done better. 
outside of just like watching it to stroke your own ego, which mm -hmm. a lot of people will do, you know, watch it to see where you could have improved. There's been matches that you win that you could have improved a lot of things. There's matches that you lost that you, you did really well, yeah. you know, this happened or that happened. It's really easy to identify what went wrong. So I think it's the same, a win or a loss is kind of the same thing to me as far as what you do. You reflect on it, you review it, and you use it to improve. It's more data for, you know, your end goals, whatever those may be, that you can use it, whether it's a win or a loss, to pull your head out of your ass if you need to, or kind of change direction or improve on whatever you need to improve on. There's a lot of times that you win matches. They could be high-profile matches, or they could be what looks like a good performance that when when you were to ask me about it for real, I don't consider them to be, or I consider that, you know, I was like a six out of 10 that night. I've had matches where I've lost that I was like, I was like an eight or a nine out of 10. I've never been like perfect and lost mm -hmm. a match, but I was pretty good, man. Eight, eight and a half. And this guy was just better than me or the referee saw it another way. You know, those are things that can happen too. And you have to be able to look at that and be honest about those things. Gearing up for August, what does the ADC mean to you? The ADCC is a lifelong goal. You know, I put in my eighth grade graduation when my dream was to, was to win ADCC. You know, nobody knew what that meant. It yeah. was just random letters, you know. So, yeah, it's been a, a life goal of mine for a long time. And it's, uh, it's something that's very, very close. You know, I've been to day two my last, I've been there twice. I've been to day two twice. I've lost uh, some matches. I get closer and closer every time. My level improves like every year since, you know, 2019. I had a great 2020, great 2021. 2022, I had a great 2023, 2024 already. So, you know, the improvements, I see them. I see them happening. I see them coming. And I know that the title is is very close, you know. It's going to be it's going to be a hard tournament. It's going to be a hard journey, a long journey to get there, but the title's right there. What is it going to take for Dante Leon to raise that title? Uh, it's going to take proper execution without any mistakes. Uh, last time I was really prepared. Um, I think now I'm more prepared because I have a better team around me. I have better facilities. I have a more dialed in training schedule on all levels, all fronts. And uh, I've had more time with my nutritionist and my other coaches as well. So we have things figured out a lot better um, um, this time, I, I would say. Not that anything was really missing in the past, but now I think things are kind of dialed in nice. Um, so it's gonna, it has to be good preparation, you know, continuing with this preparation, continue having great preparation and um, execution with no mistakes. You know, one mistake at tournaments like this against opponents of, of the level that I'm competing against, that's what's cost me before in the past. You know, I've had times where I came in, I was in great shape, and I just had piss poor execution on some things. Even if it's a matter of four or five seconds, it cost me the title, and I have to wait two years to get it again. So that's even more, um, that gives me even more initiative to not make the mistakes that mm. I made before. You know what I mean? Um, so typically when I make a, make a mistake that costs me something, I do my very best and I work diligently to not do that again. So I truly believe if I don't make the same mistakes I did in the past, I'm going to be ADCC champ. What is your nutrition like leading up to this? So your nutrition is always pretty good. I try and follow it year round as much as I can. Um, you know, typically leading up to tournaments, I won't take any kind of like day away or weekend away. I'll kind of follow it seven mm -hmm. days a week. And, um, it's a lot of food, man, honestly, you know, with a, like a training session, like today, like I said, I just had three cups of pasta, like dry cups of pasta. So that's like two thirds of a box of pasta, meat sauce, uh, things like that. You know, morning is a good breakfast. After lifting is a is a snack. Um, coming out of here is a snack, and then dinner later at night. So there's a lot of food, but it's uh, it's all scheduled. It's all planned by my nutritionist Matteo Capodaglio. Uh, he's big on carbs, so uh, he's big on carbs. I really like pasta. Pasta is kind of the easiest way for me to get the amount of carbs that I need. Yeah. Um, I 
I've suffered through eating like three cups of rice before. That's hell. I can't cook rice very well, so I try not to do that. So it's pasta, man. It's pasta, pesto sauce, pasta, and uh, and meat sauce. Try and stay away from Alfredo or anything like that, yeah. but try and keep it as clean as possible, but a lot of pasta. When you have a coach in the corner, what is their objective with someone of your, um, I guess, ex- experience, or experience or expertise in uh, – in a match? The majority of their work's already kind of been done before that, you know. Um, having somebody in the corner, they have, uh, they have a lot of jobs, I think. You know, they have to be cognizant of the time that's on the clock. They have to be cognizant of the way the match is going. They have to be able to say and do things that can get a response out mm-hmm. of you. They have to be able to kick in the ass if you need it. They have to be able to pick you up, slow you down. Things like that. That's the most important. They have to be able to tell you the time and at the right times. You know what I mean? If you're a 10-minute match and a coach is like 940 left, I mean, cool, dude. You know what I mean? So, And they have to know you well. They have to be able – I think somebody in your corner has to have a good relationship with you because they have to know you a little bit, you know, and that comes down to coaches and athletes. But, you know, the majority of their works happen outside, you know. They're not really trying to, like, hold your hand through techniques – they're letting you know what options to do. They're letting you know what they see. But the main thing is they're talking to you. You yeah. know, they're they're getting they're getting you going if you're slow. They're slowing you down. They're telling you to chill out. However, they're going to do it, and that becomes very personal. So I think you need a a good relationship with somebody in the corner. So what's the next few weeks like for you leading up? I'm going to compete again next weekend. So finish out my week training. Um, compete next weekend in in Las Vegas. Uh, the American Nationals, IBJJF tournament. So pretty good. It should have three matches over there. So perfect amount. Uh, that's like seven weeks away from ADCC. So get in, get out. And uh, pretty much then it's just going to be in the gym. It's just going to be training, you know, my regular schedule. Uh, Monday through Friday, we do comp training. Saturdays, we do a session. And uh, Sundays typically is mobility and lifting. Um, maybe some drills, but typically no. Uh, in this camp. So it's just going to kind of be the same thing as always. The Tuesday is kind of always the same. We just adjust uh, we adjust the frequency of jiu-jitsu training and like the intensity of the training depending on what's coming up. So because tournaments have been coming up, the Tuesdays have been heavier. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday is also a decently heavy day. Thursday, we taper down a little bit. We get a good lift in on Thursday, so we taper down the jiu-jitsu. And then Friday is another hard day, and Saturday is always adjustable. You know, it depends on what you need. Um, I think it's imperative to get the other things in, like you get your sleep in, you get your meals in, you get your strength training in, and jujitsu is always what's adaptable. You're never taking away from jujitsu to give to yeah. those things, but you know, you always do those things to keep you as healthy and as strong as possible. Um, and depending on how your week's gone, you adjust your jiu-jitsu training as need be. So, you know, Saturday could be a really tough session. Saturday could be a easier session, but there's going to be some kind of training. Dante, thanks for coming in. Chat to you again soon. Thanks, Tom.